Happy Thursday, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Rocketeer Minute, where each and every day, Monday through Friday, we go over one minute of the greatest adventure movie Walt Disney's ever made, the 1991 Joe Johnston-directed feature, The Rocketeer. I'm one of your hosts, Jim O'Kane of TVDads.com. And I'm Hal Bryan, an airplane nerd from the Experimental Aircraft Association here in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Jim, <laughs> the countdown continues. Yeah. Here we are in minute 104. 104, I, yeah. It's... People are getting sick of me saying every day, well, I can't believe it. Well, <laughs> you know, I guess if I couldn't believe it yesterday, yeah, why could I believe better, it today? You but better I, start working on your faith on this, <laughs> at the end of yes, the season. exactly. Yeah. So well, I, got... I do believe it, actually. I do believe we have done... Uh, we have done this many episodes, yeah. and and uh, we've right got in the home stretch. We've got five to go, including this one. So we'll, let's, we'll, and we're still really not a lot's been happening this week, other than all everybody's getting their boxes checked. We uh, right. we're saying we're waving goodbye at uh, Howard Hughes as he yep, pulls he off. Starts off the minute by backing out and heading off down. Uh, was it Oxnard Street? Oxnard Street on the way, I guess, to Oxnard. So uh, we never. Never quite sure where this location is. I mean, we've we've over the past hundred or so episodes, we've talked right. about that it might be Burbank, it might be LAX. As far as I can tell, yeah. there is no there is no place on a map where Oxnard Street crosses Encino Street in LA, right? Um, or Encino. But we know that we know the diner is almost attached to the airport, or it's you know it's it's right right near the airport and we do see the uh in bigelow stationery we see the address that puts it right at lax but but as you said you know oxnard or as i thought it was briefly orchard street for some reason but oxnard and encino don't intersect but yeah uh, well, orchard sounds good because of all the uh the orange trees with those beautiful plastic oranges just yes <laughs> hanging exactly but you know what if uh uh all I can tell you is the Bulldog Cafe is where, I, and Chaplin Field, that's where I'd like to go when I die. Yeah. So. <laughs> Get one of their $100 hamburgers, or at least their 15-cent toasted yeah, sandwiches. Yeah, 15-cent toasted sandwich, yeah. and maybe a tamale for some yeah. reason. Yeah, with, with some ice cream on top. Tamale a la mode. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so we watch uh, we watch Howard drive off in the distance as uh, Cliff tries to deal with the fact that somebody just gave him a brand new GB with, right. with his name on it. That was the uh, that was truly a, a classy classy touch, yeah. and you know it, it, Cliff's line. You know, didn't even get a chance to thank him. It's always nice when uh, when PV is a little bit more gentle and kind to Cliff. You know, because he said I didn't even get a chance to thank him. You know, PV could have like smacked him on the head with a newspaper and said, "You chowderhead." You know that you know that was rude or go after him or go after him you dope yeah could have done anything like that now, but instead you, he just pv makes it okay you saw the look on your face you don't have to son no pv must have known don't you think i would i would think he had to have but but really when did all this happen uh, this is the next morning i mean he's reading yeah, the paper this is all, and so yeah so you know it's like they got they flew uh, i mean the off screen we're thinking this is what danny bilson had called plausible off scene action and right. So somewhere, somewhere off scene, Howard Hughes said, "Look, I want to give Cliff a plane. Where would I meet him?" And he said, "Oh, he's always at the Bulldog at the corner of Oxnard and uh, and Sino. <laughs> so if you show up there, like you know, eight o'clock in the morning tomorrow, I'm right. sure he'll be there." He goes, "Oh, good. I'll finish painting, uh, finish painting uh, Lady Luck on the uh, it, on the on the nose." And uh, you know, if you if, if you look at uh, second eighteen here, you can see that. He's drawn a new Lady Luck, but instead of snake eyes, he has the uh, the Lady Luck picture of Jenny that was uh, mounted in the dashboard. So he never has to, you know, stick it behind the dashboard. There, her That's right. face is drawn right on that four leaf clover, which right means airplane. all of his bad luck went away. That that first, the you know the uh, the yellow GB had snake yep. eyes and a four leaf clover. So good luck and bad luck all crossed over each other. But now it's uh it's nothing but good luck. Either that or it's a horrible insult to Jenny. <laughs> yeah, that could be too. But you, you know, it's it's funny again trying to figure out when all this happened because remember they they went to uh Griffith Park at four in the morning. Yeah. So if this is I mean number one, if this is eight in the morning, what's everybody doing up? Yeah. <laughs> so but it's obviously morning. Yeah. Uh, I'm ass- I'm assuming cause that was that was breakfast that was coffee yeah, and orange juice, orange and juice that yeah, wasn't, yeah. you know we didn't sleep in and then everybody show up for dinner but everybody got no, up this is a Sunday morning October sixteenth nineteen thirty eight and uh, right and uh, it, it's, I'm assuming well obviously 
Cliff has changed, although he's wearing his jacket over the top, so we don't, you know, we don't really know for sure. But uh, yeah, and uh, but, and Peavy's at least Jenny had a looks, shower. Uh, just, you know, he looks yeah. freshly cleaned, and Jenny certainly yeah. tidied herself up and managed to get back to right. her, get on her tomato uh, skirt and shirt. Exactly, her her perky wholesome goodness that yeah. uh, that just shines through so well. Yeah, Hughes. You know, the one uh, the one thing that makes this all plausible again that this whole experience happened in just a few hours is the fact that i i can see somebody like howard hughes making a couple of phone calls and and yes actually getting it done yeah either i mean the other my other uh you know <laughs> when you're sitting in a car driving and staring at the windshield thinking well how could you do this when i was thinking about this particular minute, i was wondering maybe he was thinking of making a deal with uh c cord it's like okay I know you you want to keep the rocket kid, but maybe a couple of days before, he said, "I'll uh, I'll trade him a GB for the rocket, and then he's not out of pocket with his you know his new thing. It doesn't hurt me." Ah, uh, sure. So he might have had a day at most. Right. Uh, yeah, that's very possible. Although that's not... we ha- we have to just assume that he already had the he already had the GB. Yeah. Because obviously we're not going to build a GB in a day or no. All, much less a few. All hours he has to do or... is get the get the nose art dry. I mean, maybe he had early. Right. You know, hair dryers on it and spray, you know, <laughs> desperately trying to clean, well, you know, dry it off. And he's got that clean room at Long Beach with all the uh, the guys in the white coats. So yeah, and there, or shot at Long Beach. There is a guy. If you look to second twenty four, that I've puzzled over as I've frame by frame my way through. Is on the other side of the canopy. I swear that is evil Howard Hughes. That's that like Howard it really Hughes looks like him. Does it just grinning straight through? He's got that beautiful uh, you know paintbrush mustache right across the middle right. there. And he's wearing his uh, his mechanic cap, and, and uh, then there's another guy that looks like Mr. Mike from uh, Saturday Night Live, just behind him wearing a uh, wearing his hat at like kind of a jaunty angle, oh, uh, wearing right. wearing a pair of cheaters too. And there's enough a lot of people with sunglasses on here, which doesn't seem right for the era. I mean, that, sunglasses really didn't become a thing until after World War II. It, it's kind of a I mean, Polaroid did have uh, have a bit of a, a thing going on. Um, but it wasn't, you know, the right. polarized glasses weren't a common thing. One thing we yeah, didn't... Yeah, you saw them in... Uh, oh, I, I was just going to say, you saw them in flying uh, flying goggles a bit. Yeah. You saw those, you know, those, uh, like especially the heavy green tinted uh, goggles, like uh, some of the Navy pilots in particular would have been wearing starting around this time. But, but yeah, you just didn't see, you know, Joe Blow walking down the street that much. Yeah, yeah. There, there are a couple of... Uh, uh, things that we we didn't talk about in the last minute that we kind of start up in this minute. One of them is that uh, diamond shapes uh, stop sign, which is not the oh, right. typical octagonal. So I want to talk a little bit about that and the and the word above the word stop. So yeah, we we had both discussed this a little bit uh, a little bit offline, and uh, at first I had thought it was just a little bit of an anachronism because it found that there was a, a couple of different groups, uh, the National Conference on Street and Highway Safety. And then the uh, publication called the Manual and Specifications for the Manufacture, Display, and Erection of U.S. Standard Road Markers and Signs, which is a mouthful. Those two things were already well in place and working on standardized designs for road signs in particular, things like stop signs. And they had introduced a version of the octagon that we know today. They'd introduced that in 1935, which would be a few years earlier than this. Oh, maybe that's that's not right. But then you zoomed in and... and uh, Got out your jeweler's loop, and you uh, you spotted the word on the top of the stop sign, which led us uh, somewhere very different. Yeah, this it seems to be part of the uh, Auto Club of Southern California, which you know back in the days when uh, the government really wasn't do, doing much to support road work, other than building the uh, the national uh, the the national highway system, which is those uh, those U.S. federal roads that you see, you know, Route One and Route Sixty Six, and all those other ones, the the badged ones. Uh, they tried to work on standardizing signs across the country, but in the meantime, it was up to local um, car enthusiasts to build to build out the uh, the safety signs to help people uh, navigate their way around Southern California. In this case, the Auto Club of Southern California hung up a bunch of stop signs that looked like that, and they would announce uh, Boulevard stops, which was this this particular intersection where they haven't you and you can see it there's there's one on this side of the street and there's one across the street those signs were provided by the uh, auto club of southern california they were made of uh, porcelain on metal they were made by actually a company that made bathtubs so they just you know expanded their uh, their painting and um, foundry facilities 
and made a bunch of these signs and hung them up. They were still in use as late as the 1950s when the state of California took over uh, all signage on uh, on public roads. To this day, according to at least according to Wikipedia and a couple of uh, road enthusiast uh, web pages, there may still be some out in the backwoods. You might be driving along a back road and and see these signs, but I have a feeling that collectors have kind of uh, filched them all off of uh, right. most of the major major intersections. And if you do a Google image search for uh, boulevard stop sign, uh, you'll see a few that are, of course, full of bullet holes, which ah. seems uh, <laughs> sort of par for the course. Now, here's bouncing around just a little bit. Right around second 22 or second 23, um, we've talked or we certainly will talk a bit more about uh, in this whole s- section. And I, to be honest, the recording out of order, I think I don't think it's come up yet. But there's there seems to be sort of real Millie and fake Millie. Yeah, there's there's the tale of two Millies here, and we're seeing yes. real real Millie is there at uh, Mar- you know beloved character actress Margot Martindale yes. is at the very right hand side of the screen. She's just smiling and she's wearing right. her she's wearing her floral uh, uh, dress with the uh, uh, unusual not unusual but rather self identifying sleeves that are kind of a, a diamond shape. And uh, as we roll through this minute, uh, well after. After the kissing part gets over, uh, yeah. we can. After all the after all the icky smooching, yeah, and and PV, when PV's, Cliff is totally getting girl well, germs, yeah, exactly, cooties. Uh, yes. uh, PV walks away, and we see fake Millie. It's uh, this woman in a yeah. floral print dress with a with a diamond or a, a triangular cuff. Right, and she's got the same haircut as Millie, but she's uh, obviously stunt Millie, and she's she seems to be you know so deliberately staged right there with her you know, present, but her back to the camera until she turns a little bit to the left. And then, you know, we're supposed to be focusing on, on uh, Cliff and Jenny finishing their kiss sort of to the right of the frame. And then of course, PV is drawing our eye to them as he moves from left to right. I think, uh, I think you're right. I think we're not supposed to notice. That's got to be a, a, you know, Margot Martindale stand in and who knows, who knows how long this little segment took to shoot and, and yet another another question that we may have for um, some people that are coming up uh, next week. Uh, I right. want to find out if this. Uh, I, I'm still. I I just went to the revival of Star Trek Two, where I know that they added in the remember part so they could get uh, you know at Spock, so they could get a Star Trek Three out of the whole thing. But I'm wondering if this portion of the you know here's a here's a way I can rebuild the X Three without Howard Hughes. Right. Um, if that got dropped in later and these people were kind of uh, assembled to film this one little bit and they couldn't get Margot Martindale to be there at the time, so they just dropped in uh, Margot Martindale's uh, uh, cosplayer to uh, to <laughs> film the scene with Peavy. It's very possible, although you know um, Peavy is looking at the plans... He is looking and at it when, when Margo One is there. When uh, yeah, when the the real Millie is still is still there in frame. So it's hard to say. I just needed to to pick up from the other angles for some reason, and Margo uh, Margo wasn't around. One other uh, brief little tangent is uh, you know we've said goodbye to Howard Hughes, but uh, when this episode airs, it will be uh, yesterday, uh, September 13th, will be the an- anniversary of him setting the world uh, speed record in the Hughes H1 racer hmm. that we see in his, his hangar down there. So it was September 13th of 1935, so about three years before the movie takes place. And there he is in his H1 doing uh, 352 miles per hour, which is just almost unheard of. And we would mentioned on a recent minute that here in 2017, the uh, the piston engine land speed record was just again broken by uh, the son of Steve Hinton, Steve Hinton Jr., who flew in this film. It was uh, almost exactly 200 miles per hour faster but it took 80 years uh, to get to that point, which is pretty remarkable. Squeezing every last little bit of uh, aerodynamics out of the, the airframe. Amazing. Yes. Right. I was trying, on an entirely different subject, I was trying to remember if uh, Jenny had painted nails. when She she did have painted nails when she was at the South Seas Club, right? I, did she? I, 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 I can't get over how well, you know, how perfect they look. <laughs> right. This. I would think that she would have scuffed them a bit on the way, but hard, hard well, to say. I don't think anybody went to sleep, you know. No. I think everybody went home, cleaned up, changed, you know. She probably 
probably uh, you know redid her nails at that point. I just thought of a timing thing that might you know something. I am now I have another bit of uh, biological factor here to uh, to <laughs> announce the time difference. The scene where um, the real Margot Martindale is. Right. If you look carefully at Jenny's left eye, she has her sty. Okay. And then when we go for the close-ups, the sty seems to have evaporated. So this oh, may really? be at a different time. Ah, Very we're well going to have be. to. <laughs> you know, and I think the little uh, the little cut on Cliff's lip changes. Yeah. Changes throughout this minute as well, depending on the angle. Although it may just be, it, it looks like there's actually just a little bit of blood on it. And maybe he's, you know, used his yeah. shirt sleeve and wiped it off. Yeah, but right doesn't... at the start of this minute, second two and three. Yeah, he's got it's... that cut about a third of the way over on the right-hand side of his mouth. Right, and it's, then, it's, and then it's it pretty prominent. That she kissed it away apparently because it's not it's not there when he's back talking. To well, her. even in even earlier before the the big kiss in uh, second you know thirteen or so he's having his exchange with PV. I didn't get a chance to thank him. It's just a line. It's not. Uh, it doesn't yeah. have sort of the extra makeup effects of blood and things on it. So, so many, many, so details. many questions, so many so, questions, and so so many years have gone by. Yes. I, 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 <laughs> I, I, we, we can ask Billy, but he he will probably say I don't. I'm not right. sure. Or I don't. Rem, I don't quite remember that part. And then he'll admonish me for picking fleas. Yes, as he says. Oh which, yeah, yeah. That that very opening is very a, a 3D. That that is a 3D cut, which right. seems to disappear with a kiss. So maybe she has magic healing powers. You never know. She was just I she was just out of labyrinth. So you know, there you have it. Um, <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Somewhere David Bowie is singing in the bushes. Quite a uh, quite a little moment. Uh, it, it's th- there's so many finishes here and, and so many promises of movies to come. I mean, it right. just felt like they could just roll right out of this. Yeah, so TV was going to come out. Here's the X4, you know, the, or the and, X3.1. Uh, but yeah, I like the X4 better. Such a nice, uh, such a nice little. As you said, so many closings, so many, uh, so many little flourishes. Jenny having. Sn- uh, stolen the, the PV's notes back, the plans that he had written or drawn up, giving it to him. And he's, I, I love how excited he is about it because, you know, the last time he was really talking about the X3 was just, we gotta just get it back and, you know, wish we'd never found the thing. Or it was Cliff's line, but let's get this thing out of our lives. Now he's looking at it and suddenly he has an idea and that's that, just that wonderful engineer's spark. And of course he's trying to tell Cliff about it. Cliff is, is distracted. He's, yeah. he's busy, uh, he's busy, uh, you know, winning yeah, the girl. Can't, yeah, can't you hear the music is swelling, PB? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Busy and here. I just the, the one of my favorite scenes is uh, is with PB is he's he's so upbeat, he's so excited, he's trying to tell Cliff. Cliff won't pay him any attention at all for obvious reasons. So then he just looks around and says, "Hey, Goose, Goose, you want <laughs> you want to hear this? I got to tell somebody." You know, it's I think next he would have gone to Patsy, maybe. Yeah, it's, Patsy, and, let's talk about manifold pressure. And this is all under the impression I mean, the impression that you get is they all think that the Nazis have stopped looking right i I would think that you know they want the plans that pv has if neville had them maybe he hasn't had time to transmit them or give them to somebody but they still know that somewhere the plans or no they don't know that he has the plans right they don't because pv drew these plans himself so they were counting on neville to bring the actual rocket pack out yeah before he uh it all depends what they told the guy on the uh on the radio I mean, I would, I would assume that somebody's hightailing it back to the FBI agents. Fitch and Woolley must be this morning over at Neville's house, going through that, the, you know, the secret room with the uh, with the right. radio and getting that all getting that all mopped up and and uh, you know, so I, I, I could certainly see in a sequel. Obviously, the the Germans would be still working to try to get their uh, get their hands on this thing, but uh, you know, they wouldn't have the network of support in L.A. that that they did. That would all be mopped up and any sort of leftover henchmen or spies saboteurs as they say mm. would likely have been uh, swept up by our our friends the g-men well hopefully well, you know other well well you never know if we if we could find out about the sequel we <laughs> right we may ask some people where, where this may head i uh yeah i'd, I'd really be curious uh to see you know as this scene was being written and we're making sure we've got room for a sequel and we've got a launch pad for a sequel, even if nothing was written down, even if nothing was official, you know, there must have been some ideas. I know when we talked to Danny Bilson before, was he was talking about uh, Cliff's New the York New, Adventure. The New York Adventure. He right. would go right into the, into so the storyline that was gone in gone straight book. into that, um, which sure would have been uh, would have been great to see. Inevitably, of course, you know, we've got to see we've got to see the Rocketeer uh, on the front lines in World War II, which in the follow-on comic series in the last few years, we've seen a lot of that. Still wondering what happened to the laughing bandit did they finish production right and was it uh, it was it dedicated in memoriam you know for neville yeah. and 
did they uh, did they run a nice uh, memorial reel at the Oscars? I don't know if, yeah. they, if they'd started the memorial thing yet at that, by this time. Well, they already had the you know, Irving Feldwerk Award, so they do remember dead members of the Academy. So, so I would think that maybe they had some kind of salute to salute right. to Neville. And is we don't we don't have any sense for how long how far along in the production they were at the Laughing Bandit. I don't think they um, were probably well into it because they were yeah. filming the climax. And uh, ah, that's true. That yeah, that's that, that was the big reveal and. Uh, you know when uh, yeah, Neville takes what, off the takes off the uh, the yeah, tiny no, no, no. mask. Yes, <laughs> yes. No and uh, he did manage to uh, stab the co-ho the co-stars. <laughs> That's true. Okay. They're going to have to go in and fix some of that, but uh, maybe recast it. Who knows? Uh, well, we can we, we can ask some people involved in the production later later on this next week. Um, but I think we've we really have to say goodbye to a lot of the stuff going here. We've we've finished the the to- the talking part. Well, no, we haven't quite finished it. Yeah, we've got just um, a little bit left. We have a, a particularly great great line tomorrow. Yes. So, but uh, this is yeah, PV PV having a great line of Hey Goose. <laughs> yes. But we're ah, definitely great. definitely winding it down and. Uh, and uh, you, I think you can hear the reluctance in both of our voices. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, it's it's beautiful hearing the James Horner score. You know, if you're going to go out on something that that just this, the beautiful strings there, the the the, the violas and the cellos, and, and then the harps in the background, and and all that all that fat brass playing. Uh, it's, yeah, it's good stuff. It's, it's the right way to go. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll talk about this some more t- uh, tomorrow. I think so. Let, let's uh, let's pick it up there. If you all would like to join in the conversation, we are always available. at The usual uh, locations. Find us on Twitter, Rocketeer Minute. Find us on Facebook, Facebook dot com slash Rocketeer Minute. Find us at the big site, Rocketeer Minute dot com. You still have time to uh, subscribe to us on either iTunes or Google Play. One of the things we would really appreciate is if you are. Uh, on iTunes, or if you're not on iTunes, get you know subscribe and please get on iTunes and leave us a review. It always helps people look at reviews, read reviews, and decide whether they're going to listen to something based often on how many reviews. Leave as many stars as you can, and, and uh, if you leave a good word for us there, we'd really appreciate that because uh, people do apparently read those reviews. So uh, thank you, and for those who have left reviews, thank you again for uh, for being that that kind. Uh, but we'll pick this up tomorrow with a very interesting guest. Uh, I'm sure you will be fascinated because we were fascinated when we recorded this out of order. So join us here as we finish up the week on the Rocketeer Minute. So until next time, over and out. Over and out.